Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to the second in our series on making sense of the pandemic. I'm Professor Brad Evans, and I'll be the host for this event today. Now, in this public session, we are going to be discussing the science of the virus. Now, to give you some background, the Minerva lectures are run by the University of Bath. They're important for us in terms of connecting with local and wider communities. Now, whilst this engagement has moved online invariably due to social, social distancing measures, we're still delighted that you can join us here today. Now, probably like you, I'm very much looking forward to this session as it actually goes well beyond my area of expertise. And I think I hope to learn as much as anybody else about this. Now, now I also believe that one of the things that perhaps most of us could agree with today is that the pandemic has revealed to us the importance of science, something perhaps we take often far too for granted, especially in terms of thinking about everyday security and well-being. I'm therefore delighted to be joined here today by Dr. Andrew Peston, Dr. Azal Sarbeva and Dr. Ben Hingsworth. Andrew is a researcher who specializes in infectious diseases, including molec the molecular basis for host pathogen interactions. He has a long standing interest in vaccinology, including the design and the testing of vaccines. Now, much of his research has focused on whooping cough, or a new word which I've suddenly learned called peritusis, which is a respiratory disease for which we have considered many of the questions which have been asked by COVID 19 today. In his talk, he will cover the basics of how SARS or COVID-2 infects and transmits between people, the current status in the search for therapeutics, namely the drugs to treat the illness, the current status of the COVID-19 vaccine development, and the infection basis to lead to current control measures, for example, shielding, social distancing, hand washing, masks, and so forth. Azal is a lecturer in chemistry, working on a new technology that can make, vac make vaccines stable without refrig refrigeration. Another term which I've suddenly come across, it's called ensilization. I believe that's a pronunciation is correct. Now, most vaccines today require refrigeration, transportation, and the storing of vaccines is inevitably challenging. So technologies such as ensilization could help us make vaccine programs easier, cheap, cheaper and much less wasteful. It will also have this remarkable humanitarian aspect to it because it will allow us to bring vaccines to some of the most remote areas of the world. And today she will talk about the logics of distribution and the administration of new COVID-19 vaccine once that is actually put into production. And finally, Ben is a lecturer in health psychology who specializes in using digital tools to support behavior change across a range of diseases and conditions. He currently leads a UK funded, funded study into germ defense, which is a digital website that uses behavioral change techniques to reduce the infection transmission of COVID-19. To date, this has, it has enjoyed an impressive over 100,000 people using it and has been translated into more than 20 languages. Ben will talk to us today about what behavioral science is and what it has been used for during the coronavirus pandemic. He will discuss the different approaches to changing people's behavior and address some of the key challenges which come with them. And he will finish his talk by discussing how researchers at Bath have been developing evidence-based tools to support behavioral change. Now this promises, as already I've indicated, to be a truly informative session. And I'm truly delighted that each of these speakers have been able to join us here today. To just give you a brief sense of the format, each of the speakers will be speaking for rough, roughly eight minutes. We will then open this up to a Q&A session, which each of the speakers will have the chance to respond. There is the option via your interface to actually submit questions, so please do submit them to us. Okay, so without any further hesitation, I'm now delighted to pass you over to the first of our speakers, Andrew Peston. Thanks very much, Brad. So as you stated, I'm going to give a bit of a whirlwind overview to some of the basics about how we catch this virus, how we pass it on to other people, and of course, some of the measures that we're taking and, and will take to try and stop that cycle of infection. So the COVID-19 is obviously a respiratory infection, largely. And so we are breathing 
the, the virus into our airways and the virus attaches to some of those cells within our airways and from doing so it triggers its uptake inside of those cells and then enters into its replicative cycle so a single virus particle can enter a single cell but then drop producing hundreds of millions of new virus particles as a massive amplification and generally they burst open those uh, respiratory cells releasing those new virus particles which of course are then free to infect neighboring cells or in the case of a respiratory infection such as covid we can breathe them out into the environment around an infected person and so one of the key ways that we, we we can track this virus is by being close to an infected person and breathing in directly the contaminated respiratory droplets that they've exhaled that's contained the virus particles and of course respiratory infections often accompanied by symptoms such as sneezing and coughing and they produce an awful lot of respiratory droplets so so a lot of virus can be uh, exhaled and put into the air around them of course those droplets can also descend onto the surfaces around the infected person and that can carry the viruses onto those surfaces and contaminate them so another way that we can pick up this virus is by touching contaminated surfaces and then transferring those viruses on your hands to your nose and your mouth through touching your face. And I think we've all learned over the past couple of months just exactly how many times we end up touching our face without even realising it during the course of a day. There is evidence that the virus can be present within faeces. But again, it's not clear at the moment whether those are infectious virus particles and what role that faeces and stools may play in passing the virus on. But I think we should consider them a risk for the moment. Unfortunately, there's no evidence at all for the virus being present in other bodily fluids. For example, sweat. So there's been a lot of discussion about the risk of, of, of exercise and being, you know, gyms reopening. But the virus doesn't get into the sweat glands and so sweat is, is not a risk. So, of course, you know, we've got to then consider, and this comes into part of the talk where we consider the infection control mechanisms, is, is how, how can we stop that virus being spread between people? So we're reliant on the, on the distancing, the two metre rule, and avoiding contaminated surfaces. And we're going to be reliant upon those until maybe the great white hope of the pandemic comes through, which of course is the vaccines. So uh, I think there's been much discussion about how reliant we are on, on, on getting a successful vaccine before we sort of uh, exit this pandemic hell in which we find ourselves. So ordinarily when the immune system encounters a pathogen such as a virus, it responds to it relatively non-specifically and relatively slowly, but then that response becomes much more specific to that pathogen and it becomes much stronger over the course of several days to a couple of weeks. And it's at that stage when we start to see the the antibodies being produced that have been much discussed in testing and, and with vaccines. But the important thing about that, that encounter is what we also do is we train an immune response. So we get a memory of that, that, that encounter with the pathogen. So if we encounter the same pathogen again, we trigger this memory response, which kicks in much quicker and much stronger than that first one. So those memory responses is what we're aiming for, to induce by introducing part of the virus through a vaccine and so the vaccine actually trains the immune response to produce the memory so that the first time we actually encounter the covid uh, virus we trigger that much faster stronger robust tailored response that hopefully will overwhelm the virus and mean we don't actually go down with disease at all in the first place and so that's that's what all of the different vaccines that are in development are attempting to do so there's well over 100 different covid19 vaccine projects underway of course, there's about five or six so far, uh, a little bit ahead of the others, and have reached testing in human trials, including, for example, the Oxford uh, COVID vaccine, uh, as well as a couple in the States and a couple in China. So at the moment, we're now into the relatively slow phase of vaccinology, which is the testing. So we can speed up various aspects that have got us to now, but now we can't really speed up the human immune system. So the, the, the trials that are underway are asking two key questions. Is the vaccine safe? We don't want a vaccine to be administered to people and cause unwanted side effects. And of course, at the same time, because of the need, we're also asking the question, do the vaccines actually work? So do they stop someone from going down with the disease? Or even better, do they stop them from becoming infected with the virus in the first place? And I think we'll probably get some of those results from those trials underway by, I would say, late summer, certainly into the autumn. So hopefully by that stage, we'll have one or more 
preferably more vaccines that are showing good signs of being what we call efficacious, so working to prevent people from becoming sick and or infected. But then we face the enormous challenge of how do we scale up manufacture to produce enough vaccine doses, and if you think about it, potentially to administer to billions of people in a relatively short space of time. And that's going to be the level of vaccination required to produce this, this fabled herd immunity. So we've got the manufacture challenge, and then we've got the enormous hurdle to overcome of how do we get those vaccine doses from the relatively few sites of production on the planet to all corners of the globe, including some pretty hard to reach populations and pretty hard to reach uh, environments. And that's where ASA will come in and talk about the logistics of the vaccine chain in terms of getting them uh, administered. Chances are it's going to be well into next year before we really have a full rollout of vaccination. So until then, I'm afraid we're reliant on good old infection control measures. And so this is the idea of stopping someone who is infected, getting close enough to somebody else that they're going to pass the virus on to them. And of course, this is isolation. So we're still reliant on anyone showing signs of symptoms, self-isolate for seven days and beyond that, if they're still showing symptoms. Hand washing. The message was very strong at the beginning. It should be remaining just as strong. Again, from the risk from the, the, the contamination of surfaces, picking it up and both spreading it onto other surfaces which people might encounter. Fortunately, good old soap and water. So the detergent in soap is very effective at stripping away the outer layer of the COVID virus and inactivating it. And then, of course, the water washes the virus particles away. So isolation and hand washing remain key. We've seen a few more developments recently. So yesterday, the test and trace program was rolled out. Uh, much, uh, much fanfare. And again, that's, that's the same principles of, of stopping people from getting close enough to, to pass the virus on. But now with maybe perhaps a more proactive approach to identifying cases and not only then isolating those, but then trying to work out who those people might have contacted whilst they're in a period, period where they're spreading the virus and getting them to isolate, which of course brings in a lot of questions about compliance, enforcement, and how effective that's going to be. But unfortunately, I do think we're looking at the rest of this summer and well into autumn of having to keep going with this physical distancing. So the two metre rule is designed to keep you far enough away from an infected person that you're out of that plume of respiratory droplets. Real focus on the hand washing, uh, and trying to make all the environments that we need to go into to ease restrictions to be so-called COVID secure. But that COVID security is all based on this infection control. So it's a bit of a whirlwind overview. I'll hand back to Brad now, but I really look forward to maybe taking some questions where we can expand on a few of these points after the other speakers. So thanks very much, Brad. Thanks very much for that introduction, Andrew. And I think it's very informative. And I think one of the things that you've actually really exposed as well is this kind of situation we're in where humans are by nature social and tactile creatures, but then we're having been forced to come up against the limits of that something which is quite deadly. And I think that's really important consideration. But I, I hope one of the things which I think your introduction actually reveals also is perhaps going forward, if something good comes from this, is that societies can have a much better understanding of the way science and medical medicine works more generally. And we can hopefully have much more open conversations moving forward about what actually contribution science does make to our societies in a much more rich and informing way. And hopefully that might be something that will come from that, but hopefully we can discuss that a bit later. I will now pass over to Azal, and I'm very interested to hear about how we deal with the transportation of this potential vaccine. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Brad, for uh, introduction. My name is Asya Sarbaeva. I do research at the Department of Chemistry on vaccine thermal stability for safer transport and storage. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. So, uh, following on on uh, what uh, Andrew was talking about uh, about vaccines, um, first of all, I wanted to really stress that vaccines are one of the most effective healthcare interventions. They literally save millions of lives today. And um, every year uh, worldwide, they're saving millions of lives from crippling and life-threatening diseases. To be more precise, currently WHO estimates that about 3 million children lives are being saved every year by vaccination. And further 2 million lives could be saved if we can deliver vaccines in time to those children. Um, of course, we are finding ourselves today in the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccine availability issue came to the forefront um, uh, today for the discussions. Many politicians are asserting that once we have a vaccine or vaccines, 
all of our problems will be solved. We will be able to protect ourselves from the virus and we will all go back to our usual way of life. And of course, having a vaccine will undoubtedly be an enormous, an enormous step into the right direction. More than 100 uh, potential vaccines are being looked at at the moment. These are old vaccines and some new ones. And uh, there are um, about 10 clinical trials which are underway today. But um, as uh, Andrew already mentioned earlier, once we have a vaccine or several vaccines, preferably, there's going to be a huge logistics. How are we going to produce those vaccines? How are we going to distribute it? Logistics of vaccine distribution and administrations are not very easy. Many vaccines today require cold chain. That means that they have to be refrigerated at all times between 2 and 8 degrees centigrade. Some of the newer vaccines, for example, three formulations of Ebola vaccines, um, they, they, don't, they don't only need to be refrigerated, but they have to be frozen during transport. So they have to be transported at minus 80 centigrade. Imagine how hard it is to maintain this cold chain for Ebola vaccination campaigns in rural settings in low-income countries. Of course, we don't know yet whether the new COVID vaccine will require cold chain, but since majority of the vaccines today do, we would assume that they will. So let me describe the cold, cold, current cold chain. Cold chain means that vaccines are refrigerated all the way from the time they're manufactured until the time they're administered to patients. This includes being airlifted within the country or between countries, being sent by road um, in vehicles which are refrigerated, being stored between shipments, between destinations. And during all of that time, they really have to be refrigerated. Some of them have to be frozen, but majority have to be refrigerated. So cold chain adds a, a huge layer of complexity on top of already complex logistics for transport and administration. There are so many things that can go wrong. To name but few, to, to name but few, um, it could be um, lack of electricity or power, broken equipment, timing issues, uh, human error, and many others. So all of those problems, um, or some of them, if not planned properly, could arise and lead to vaccine inactivation and wastage. The reason why we know this because um, COVID, because before COVID-19 pandemic, we already have been wasting vaccines, unfortunately. This is a recurring issue not only in low-income countries, but also in many rich nations. Just to give you an example, in US in 2016, in just one state, $750,000 uh, worth of vaccines have been wasted due to inappropriate cold chain conditions. So they were unfortunately frozen instead, to, inst instead of refrigeration. So according to CDC, thousands of children during that year had to be revaccinated again. So you can see it's, 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 it's a problem everywhere in the world. Um, of course, we have uh, expertise from WHO because WHO has been doing um, vaccinating programs for more than 50 years now, all around the globe. So we have a wealth of expertise there which we can draw from. The big difference between current pandemic and previous vaccinating programs is that um, this time the focus will be not on vaccinating children, but on vaccinating adults. We will first need to vaccinate medical personnel, key workers, and also vulnerable people. So uh, this is going to bring another layer of complexity on top of uh, already quite a complex uh, logistics um, uh, problem for the distribution and production. So I don't want to finish on a gloomy note there. here. Um, I think um, my take home messages, um, I, I wanted to uh, reiterate three take home messages from this. Is first one uh, is uh, again, vaccines is the best way for preventing diseases spread and they genuinely save lives and livelihoods. Um, secondly, COVID-19 vaccine production uh, distribution and administration might take much longer than many politicians are admitting today. So, um, we really need to look uh, first for the results from those clinical trials. And thirdly, I would urge I would urge anyone against spreading any misinformation. Please wait for published results from clinical trials first. And uh, I, I would also urge people from believing this in, mis misinformation, which is being spread around not only about COVID-19 pandemic, but also about vaccines in general. So I'm going to pass uh, to Brad now and we'll be happy to um, answer any questions.
Thanks very much for that, Azel. Um, I'm just kind of thinking about what you said and in relation actually to Andrew's point about, okay, what does it mean to actually vaccinate the 7 billion people on this planet? And how does that logistically look? I'm wondering whether has there ever been a greater logistical operation the world has ever faced than what we're actually currently facing now? And I think that's something which will be obviously w worth really considering as we go forward. Okay, finally, I would now delighted to pass you over to Ben who is going to talk about issues concerning the behavioural science and how Bath is even responding to this. Thank you, Brad. So it's really nice to be able to talk about behaviour change, which I think um, is at the front of a national conversation in a way that it hasn't been before now. So I'm a lecturer in health psychology at Bath um, and health psychology is the study of psychological processes and behaviours that underlie health and healthcare, but also the flip side of the coin, illness. Um, and these processes and behaviours, they're incredibly important. So it's very easy to set someone on their way towards a behaviour. It might happen, it might not. But to really get people to do the complex behaviours that we're talking about in the coronavirus response, really understanding the thoughts, beliefs and attitudes that people have is phenomenally important. So how do we actually enact behaviour change? Um, the, the first way, the way that some of you might have heard, out, heard of is nudging. So a nudge typically consists of minor modifications to an environment to facilitate a particular outcome. A really good example of a nudge is there's a staircase in the underground station in Stockholm, which has been painted to look like piano keys. So since they did that, many, many more people now take the stairs to play a tune instead of taking the escalator next to it. Um, to bring it to vaccines, um, a recent study in the US sent out 200,000 letters and each letter had a different, uh, it was from a different person or a different government body to see which one was more effective. Um, and what they actually found was all of the letters were equally effective, but the very act of sending out any letter at all made you much, much more likely to book a flu vaccination appointment. But the thing about nudges is that they work much better, or they almost only work, if you're quite likely to do a behaviour already. So something where the cost of doing the behaviour is low and the benefit of doing it is really high. Um, so most people are pretty on board with the idea of vaccination and organ donation, not everyone, but most people haven't really just got around to it for whatever reason. The problem with the protective behaviours, so things that Andrew mentioned, so hand washing, uh, wearing masks, social isolation, social distancing, is that they're complex behaviours, they often involve a big difference to our lives, and so they're quite intrusive. Um, a nudge in this scenario might not cut it. So for these complex behaviours, the available options fall into two main camps, and they're kind of either side of nudging. The first one is to artificially create a situation where people can't really not comply with your behaviour. So we've seen these with coronavirus um, through the government enacting massive sweeping measures that you can't really avoid. So uh, examples are the furlough scheme, changing the law and fining people for not doing the law, providing incentives for people engaging in these behaviours. And really, people can't not comply with these public health measures. So you might think of these as less of a nudge and more of like a hard push in the right direction. Um, now these measures actually were incredibly effective at controlling the virus, but of course they can always be improved. And I think we can learn lessons from New Zealand's approach with Jacinta Arjen, who did an amazing job of asking people to join in a collective method to in collectively engaging with these behaviours to fight the virus. So this is exactly in line with scientific studies that show that acting for the collective good is a really good way to get people to engage with behaviour rather than kind of punishing people if they don't comply with things. Similarly, clear communication of these behavioural measures is really, really important. Um, but regarding oh, these public health, these massive public health changes, obviously there's a cost to them and ultimately people not going to school and not going to work at all is quite unsustainable. So the other method for behaviour change and getting these complex behaviours off the ground is to effectively facilitate individuals to change their own behaviour for themselves. Um, this might sound simple. So Andrew mentioned touching your face. Um, I think, yeah, we've, as Andrew said, we've all become aware of how hard it is to not touch your face, this automatic thing that you just do. And I think during the eight minutes of this talk, on average, we touch our face three or four minutes, three or four times. Um, and then that's just stopping automatic things. Of course, they're starting to do other things like wearing a mask, which is intrusive. It gets in the way. It could be a bit annoying. And actually starting to get people to engage in that behaviour, again, is really hard. 
So what can we do about it? Well, one of the key things is to motivate people. So if you motivate people to do something, they're much more likely to do it. But even motivations for simple behaviours like washing your hands are actually really complex. Um, so while I think, yeah, hand washing, it's a good thing. It's going to slow the spread of the virus. If I delve in a bit more deeply, actually, if I don't wash my hands a few times today, actually, the likelihood of something happening to me is quite low as long as everyone else washes their hands. Of course, if it only takes a few people in the same little bubble to not wash their hands and we can really see the re-emergence in the beginning of the respread of the virus. Um, and this has sadly parallels with vaccination. So we're now in a situation in the United Kingdom where a few people, enough people, are not engaging in the vaccination behaviour that we've seen the re-emergence of some previously eradicated diseases. So motivating people is challenging, but it can be done. Um, clarity is incredibly important in this. So I think a good example is the, a recent government message of staying alert. So staying alert was a broad message and the idea behind it was to try and engage the whole population in a complex set of behaviours underneath a, a single slogan to stay alert. But the problem is by trying to bring in the entire population with an incredible amount of different personal circumstances and contexts and beliefs and different individuals, the, the, the message became a little bit vague and people weren't really sure exactly what they were supposed to be doing. This is in contrast with stay at home, the previous message, which had a really clear behavioural message that was applicable to everyone. So I think understanding the motivation and providing clarity is incredibly important and it's going to continue to be important with uptake of the NHS track and trace app and of course further down the line with getting people to vaccinate and attend vaccination appointments. So this is the approach that we've been taking at Bath on the Germ Defence project. Um, so Germ Defence is a government funded website and it's developed by Bath, Bristol, Southampton universities and also Public Health England. It's freely available on germdefence.org and the idea behind this website is to really understand motivations for people. So we take the time to explain things like virulence and the transmission of diseases and how protective behaviours can help slow them. We provide personalised advice, so what in your situation might help and why would you be motivated to engage in these protective behaviours? So, for example, if you're shielding, restructuring your environment by putting a bit of disinfectant by the door for packages might be helpful. Importantly, it's evidence-based, so we actually trial the version of germ defence during the swine flu pandemic, and this allows us to know that it does reduce infection transmission. And our hope is that it will provide this personalised motivation across a whole range of different people. Um, so that's all for me. Um, thank you very much for listening and back to Brad. Thanks very much for that, Ben. Um, so I'm looking through the questions which have been submitted and most of them seem to be asking very general kind of issues concerning the virus. So what I will do is I will pose the question to each of you and ask you to answer each in turn in the order of the appearance of the speakers. And the first question actually concerned, why do you think there was such a discrepancy in the country's death rates for coronavirus? So, and obviously something which seems to affect the UK in particular. So why is there such, by your estimation, such a discrepancy between different countries' death rates for COVID? COVID? So I'll start first of all with Andrew. So yeah, that's been much discussed and indeed much avoided uh, at most of the briefings at Downing Street. Uh, clearly, there are several components to this. So uh, the numbers of people bringing in the, the, the virus to, to a country at, at what point? Um, so I think the later the virus hits your country, the more prepared countries were. I think to some degree, and I think we saw some countries shut down a lot earlier, and that was certainly one. So there's been a lot of debate in the UK press about whether we were too slow to initiate the lockdown. Uh, and perhaps in defence, we did suffer multiple introductions of the virus simultaneously. So the, the, the February half term was a key point for the introduction of the virus into the UK. Unfortunately, Italy was a real hot spot and a lot of people went to, to Northern Italy for the half term holiday. Um, so that, that's been one. And then you get into all the fine details, which will only really come out at the, you know, the final review in terms of 
the age of your population, the, you know, the structure of your households and multi-generational households, you've got young high transmitters and asymptomatics mixing with the really vulnerable, um, because it's really the really vulnerable and the elderly that are, that are contributing the vast majority of the fatality cases. So I, th I, th I do think there's a, there's, there's a range of factors. Uh, so certainly the speed of response, how quickly you lock down to break transmission is, is certainly one of them. But again, I think that the timing and where we were in terms of the, the sort of lots of virus being introduced simultaneously compared to other countries was also part of that equation. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and now to Azel. Um, yeah, I think um, Andrew has um, has put out pretty much all the points. Um, um, each country uh, obviously has uh, a lot of different different a lot a lot of a lot of differences between them uh, in their response, but. Um, uh, preparedness really was a, a big one, uh, which um, I think um, it, it will, of course, come out in, in the review in, in every country. But um, I think being prepared um, uh, in some countries, what, what really led to um, su well, relative success, uh, or at least, at least l l less people dying from the COVID-19. And um, unfortunately, in some uh, countries, this was uh, not um, not uh, what happened. Um, so um, I, I would say probably preparedness was the biggest um, issue, which which led to this. Thanks. And uh, yeah, this this issue of preparedness seems to be very striking from both of your responses, and how actually the later down the, the line we are, the the more kind of you know resilient we might be cut towards this. So, and over to Ben. Uh, not much more to add on what Andrew and Ezel have said. I guess the other thing is to consider that we are all from very, very different countries with very different cultural backgrounds and we're very used to sort of uh, being dictated or not being dictated rules in such a way. So from this sort of self social isolation and social distancing perspective, the degree to which those have been able to be implemented depends massively on the population that you're implementing them on. So I would possibly say that actually the UK, we're not fantastic at being told what to do. Possibly America is even stronger in that direction. And that, of course, has a huge um, effect on how effective the measures that are introduced are. Well, that kind of neatly brings me on to the next question, actually, because and this is actually concerning the use of masks. And, and I read an article recently in The Guardian also, which reiterated this and said there's more cultural propensity within certain cultures to wear masks as opposed to other cultures, especially those who've had an experience of certain types of viral infections. So I'm wondering what each of your responses would be in terms of the use of masks and how effective they actually will be in terms of dealing with the more media, medium term implications of dealing with the virus. And again, I will go to Andrew and then if we go straight to Azel and then to Ben. So in terms of just um, pure infection control, then, then masks will help because as we mentioned that this is a virus that if we breathe out uh, into the air around us and a mask will stop that from happening. But I know there have been other factors that have contributed towards the hesitancy for, for sort of a uniform recommendation to wear masks, one of which was the supply issue early on. We were struggling to, to get PPE into the hospitals where it was really needed and therefore they didn't want to create a drain on, on supply of masks. And the other issue is there is still some concern, there is some risk to wearing masks. So it may lessen your alertness, as the message now suggests. So you may feel that you're very secure by wearing a mask and maybe relax your, your vigilance, maybe against contamination on surfaces or getting too close to people. And then, of course, what you're doing is ordinarily you breathe in. And if you've got a small amount of virus, you'll breathe it out and chances are you won't be infected. If you then breathe in continuously through a mask, you end up trapping that virus on your mask. And so you build up the concentration onto the mask. So there is some concern that the real danger point comes when you take that mask off and the act of doing so releases a lot of virus particles at much larger concentration into the air immediate around you where you can breathe in. So there is some element of needing to use the masks properly and carefully. 
so that you you benefit from the full protection, which undoubtedly they, they will block. You know, a lot of the, the the breathing out of the virus from an infected person. Uh, yes, these are uh, really all good points, which um, Andrew talked about um, about wearing masks. Um, and um, I, all I'm going to add to it is that. Um, if we take on average, majority of the population probably will benefit from wearing a mask or, um, as the government is now saying, face coverings. Because uh, the big the big uh, issue at the moment is that we may not have enough masks for everybody. So obviously saying a, a face covering that could um, that would cover um, well, that could cover lots of things. Um, so it could be a self-made mask from, made from anything. And the biggest issue here is that if you are um, in using the public transport, for example, and if there is somebody infected next to you, mask probably will save you from infection. Of course, it's not 100%, nothing is 100%, but uh, it probably will help you not to contract the virus. So uh, on average, I would say most of the people will benefit wearing some kind of face, face uh, covering. Um, let's not call it a mask uh, for now, but um, covering the face somehow to protect themselves from uh, the virus. Yeah, I mean, again, I'd agree with uh, both the previous speakers. I, I guess the only other thing to consider is that I really do think the message about masks has to be absolutely clear. And unfortunately, the kind of length of time it's taken to get that clarity has already muddied the waters somewhat. Um, I think it's recoverable. So if there is really clear provision of information about what to do with masks, of course, they may, well, they will make a big difference, I guess. One thing to be aware of is compensatory behaviour. So uh, Ada brought up the example of public transport. Um, what we need to avoid is if I have a mask, if I was riding my bike to work and I get a mask, then I think, oh, well, it's fine for me to go and get on public transport. Whereas actually, because by adopting a more risky, different behaviour, because I've got a mask, that somewhat negates the benefits of masks. What we need is clear messaging so that not only do I wear a mask, but I also continue to engage in the other protective behaviours like washing my hands and social distancing. Thanks, Ben. Um, so moving on to perhaps a, an issue which would perhaps be far more contentious as somebody like myself who's a political theorist, and um, it's the move on to track and trace apps. And obviously, you, you, a lot of you have talked about already what we need to do in terms of individual responses. And Ben, you've also already talked about the behavioural changes how effective do you think the track and trace app would be? And how would you convince someone like myself that this is actually necessary in the society? Um, in all honesty, I don't know the evidence, but I'm pretty sure it's one of the best ways at the moment to continue to maintain social distancing. So at some point we have to go back to work and continue. And rather than all of us doing these huge behaviours, the track and trace app, provides a system where only some people who need to do those behaviours need to engage in the behaviours. So it is going to be an effective way to maintain the social distancing and the protective behaviours for the people. Um, in terms of how effective it will be, one of the key issues is of course going to be uptake and convincing people to use it. And it's not just going to be uptake of the app because often we fall into this trap where we say, oh, only 60% of people have downloaded the app or only 40% of people have downloaded the app. Um, what's going to be really important is not just downloading the app, but actually doing the behaviours that are required if the app says that you've been in touch with someone. Um, and again, there could be a system where you think, oh, I've, I've got the app on my phone, therefore I'm absolutely fine to roam around not wearing a mask, not washing my hands and going really close to people. Um, so I do think it's incredibly important that people use it appropriately, but again, the messaging on why we need to use it, the motivation for people, and as you say, uh, Brad, your particular motivation to use it may be different to someone else's and it's important to find the right message that works for you and it may be around privacy concerns and assuring you that those privacy concerns are okay. Um, it may be around different people for different things, so it's just going to be important to understand the problems with it and how to get people to engage with it going forwards. Yeah, thanks for that, Ben. I'll, I'll come over to both Andrew and Azel as well and see if they have anything they'd like to contribute to that as well. Uh, first to Andrew. So again, there's a report from the Royal Society that came out. It's pretty much the same day as, the, as it was announced yesterday. But their estimate was you might get as much as 20-25% of possible infections being uh, averted 
in this way. Um, so it's certainly part of the landscape, but as Ben has pointed out, it's only an addition to the infection control that we have. So it's going to be very poor at picking up asymptomatic infections, because of course it relies on someone hitting the big red button um, when they're showing symptoms. And if you're not showing symptoms, you'll still be moving about not knowing you might be spreading it to other people. But certainly anything that, that really helps um, identify people who have been exposed. And then, as Ben said, they adopt the behaviour of self-isolating, even though they might still be feeling perfectly fine and end up not actually ever showing symptoms, it will only be really effective uh, if all of that comes together. So I think the, the, the answer is, well, we'll find out, won't we? Uh, yes, uh, it will be interesting to see whether um, majority of the people will adopt this um, uh, this app and uh, will follow the behavior. And uh, I think Ben already said that we really need to find the right message for people to um, to uh, follow to follow and adopt it um, in the future. So it will be interesting to see how the government will deal with this. Um, and um, I really hope that they will take advice from uh, people like Ben and um, other specialists. OK, so we now have a, another question from Hakan. And Hakan is, I guess, asking more about again, perhaps some of the political limitations to why there is not a vaccine already in production. And his question is, is the reason there hasn't been a vaccine to date more a reflection of the biological properties of the virus or due to economic considerations? And is there perhaps a lack of a global political will which is standing in the way of the vaccine production, maybe? Uh, actually, I think the, the, the vaccine part of the pandemic may turn out to be the success story uh, because actually this has been remarkably quickly. This is a new virus. We only really found out about it uh, being on this planet at the end of December. So to have something in testing already is, is, is quite remarkable. Um, so you can't, because it's a specific unique virus, you can't actually use existing vaccines against it because they're just simply not related enough for them to be effective. So yes, we had SARS, yes, we had MERS. We did start to make vaccines against them, but then actually those epidemics died out quite naturally. They sort of burnt out and disappeared. And therefore, part of it was, yes, the, the, the motivation to continue with those vaccines slightly faded, but actually they were very difficult to test because there just simply wasn't any disease around. But they certainly gave us a heads up on the types of vaccines that are likely to be effective. And so the, the, the Oxford vaccine is very much based on, on the technology that was used um, for, for MERS. In fact, some of the clinical trial data for the MERS vaccine came out um, during this pandemic. In terms of political will and, and economics, I, I, I don't think there has been any limitation because actually money has been thrown at this. And, and the expediency by which all countries have embraced this and, and there's been you know, un, unheard of collaboration between different entities for this, I think has really been one of the success and perhaps heartwarming stories of this, of the pandemic so far. Indeed, I absolutely agree with what Andrew said. I, I think the vaccine side probably will be the success in this story, because if you look at the previous pan, uh, pandemics, um, well, I'll call them pandemics, but these are actually the reoccur reoccurring diseases which we're still seeing around. Uh, diseases like, for example, measles, measles um, rubella, um, uh, pitasis, um, and others. Um, so these are the diseases which are still being spread around. But um, each vaccine which works against, uh, well, which works um, in uh, protecting against those diseases, it's a specific vaccine which decades to develop. Yeah, so not really much to add there to what Andrew and as I was saying, um, I guess the, the only thing I think worth noting is that I all, I do think that actually the UK government has been, in terms of their science and their research they've been conducting, has been quite forethinking in terms of a lot of the projects that are happening at the moment to develop vaccines and behavioural things, trying to learn lessons to take forward for future pandemics. I think in terms of collaboration, in terms of production, in terms of implementing behaviour and in terms of implementing vaccines, there is in almost every project there is an arm that is kind of trying to work out, OK, how can we do this better next time should this happen again? 
Thanks, Ben. Uh, we seem to have a slight technical difficulty earlier with Azel, but I think we will go back to her because I think what you were saying was very important. So I'd like to go back to you so you can actually carry on what you were saying. So if we look at the uh, a lot of other diseases which have been around, so diseases like measles, rubella, pertussis uh, and others, we, we still meet them around today. Polio is another example. Each of them have, um, each of them have uh, specific formulations of vaccines which have been designed against those diseases. Sometimes uh, design of those diseases took years to develop, uh, sometimes even decades. So it actually takes a really long time scientifically to develop uh, a specific vaccine. So what we're seeing today, um, the speed with which uh, vaccine against COVID-19 va uh, COVID is being developed, it's, it's really, truly unprecedented. It's been really speed, sped, sped up uh, incredibly. And uh, I think there is a political will here, uh, which we're seeing actually, uh, where the governments are saying we want to have the va this vaccine and they are putting money, they are funding this research, uh, which is which is really pleasing to see. So um, I'm, I'm really hoping that we will have uh, a vaccine uh, in the future very soon. So I, I, I don't think there, there is, um, there is a, uh, I don't think it's a political issue. Um, I think scientifically it's just very hard to develop um, a, an um, efficient and safe uh, vaccine. And this is what we are all trying to do today. Thanks. So there's two final questions I'd like to end on, and I'm trying to want to end this maybe on a bit more of an optimistic note rather than... Uh, and I guess the first question, it's, it's kind of directed at Azel, but I think I can open it up because I'm sure all your expertise will have something really important to say to this. And it's really concerning what we can learn from history. And the question really concerns are there lessons from history in terms of logistically in which we have responded to a certain pandemic, which perhaps might give us optimism in terms of saying actually what we are facing can be overcome and we can actually deal with this. So again, I'll start with Andrew, then go to Azel and to Ben. And I guess the question is, you know, what is it from history then that we can learn and what are the reasons to be optimistic logistically and in terms of implementing the science to make sure that we come through the other side of this? Um, I don't know so much about the historical situation. I guess if we'd really learned from history, then we wouldn't be in the position we're in now. And that, I think that's one of one of the things we've had so many pandemic preparedness plans. Did we fail to implement them properly or did those plans simply not work? So even though many of those were directed against pandemic influenza, I think 2009 with the so-called swine flu showed again, even those were, were ineffective. So I think we we really the lesson to be learned is we really do need to learn the lessons. And, and to really look hard and fast at this and to recognise that where infrastructure was lacking, we need to have it in place, recognising it's going to be expensive and it may never get used for, for decades at a time if, if, if we're lucky. We've heard, what well, this is the third coronavirus in the last 20 years that's leapt into people. Uh, so we've had enough warning. And so I would say actually history has told us we haven't learned the lessons. And I think this has been such a wake up call. If we don't learn from this one, I don't think we ever will. So I think how do we how do we how do we learn those lessons what what methods what, what who's going to be the oversight seer of how we learn and it has to be at a global scale i think that's going to be really tricky to to, to get across because there's clearly a lot of divided opinions out there so um th there are there are two diseases which um have been completely eradicated previously so one of them would be smallpox and humans that was a while ago and then in 1980s, rinderpest, that's, that's in cattle, a disease in cattle, which both of these diseases have been eradicated completely. A third disease which we are very close to eradicating in the world is polio. So today, uh, polio is only met in two countries around the world. So we are very, very close to eradicating it. So we do have history of successful vaccinating campaigns and using successful vaccines to fight uh, different diseases. So we do have expertise in that in that area. I'm, I, I'm talking about the human beings here, all of us. So um, just taking from from that success, we, we know that we can do this. And um, as long as we can develop a successful vaccine against COVID-19, which um, obviously we have a lot of hope at, in at the moment. And as long as we then can actually scale it up, produce and distribute around the world, we should be able to um, overcome this uh, disease. When exactly, of course, we, we can't tell you, it, and it's probably not going to be this year, but uh, it might take several years to do that. But uh, but eventually, if we do have uh, the vaccine, we will be able to overcome this. 
I guess one of the one of the things that I think is not really again something we can learn from history, but it's hopefully something that we will learn and will take forwards um, is the global collaboration that has been observed. So I know that some of the reporting might sort of play off trials against each other and different companies racing to develop a vaccine, but actually the information that has been shared and the speed at which science has been published and the, the global collaboration of the scientific community has been unprecedented, to use a term that's thrown around a lot at the moment. And I think hopefully that hasn't really been possible before because we haven't had this global society and it will continue for any future threats that we face to be uh, the situation and the way that they're dealt with. Thanks very much for that. OK, so one final question, and I guess I'm going to kind of throw it back onto each of your disciplines, really. And, and I think it's a very important question as we as a society move forward. And it's the question is by G, and it's do you think post-COVID there'll be an increased trust and recognition in scientific expertise? And what impact might this have on other issues such as climate change and climate response? I'd also add another question onto this for each of you to then say, what would be the final message you would like to give to our audience here today as well, if you could leave them with one lasting message? So again, I would like to pass over to you in terms of what hope or perhaps an impact will have on the science expertise going forward. And what would be your final message for today? So I think some of this depends on whether science is being viewed as being successful uh, at the end of this whole process. Obviously, we started off hearing that science, you know, the, the government was being very science led and we've been through various controversies such as the, the role of modelling and epidemiology, the over reliance on science, the provision of accurate data, which of course is very difficult when, when the data is being generated on a daily basis and, we, and it, this really was brand new. So um, I, I think the relationship between the public and science has, has strengthened overall but, but it, it is still susceptible to being eroded, you know, particularly with science has been thrown out there as the shield for policy, for example. So um, my lasting legacy, I think, would be hopefully, can we, can we get trust between science and society? And that science takes into account of, of the uncertainty and, and the feelings and, and the anxieties of, of society when issuing sort of blanket, very stark data. It needs to be interpreted. We need to convey the uncertainties involved a lot more and, and, and recognizing that, you know, we're being called upon as experts, but actually we're working, you know, we're, we're working in the dark as much as many to see how this pans out. And I think we need to be honest about that. So hopefully the lasting legacy will be a new respect and recognition of what science can and cannot do, but that it has an important role to play. Well, we are seeing today the pandemic actually has changed uh, many aspects of our life and um, I'm really hoping that it will also change um, this um, this trust, which um, Andrew talked about, trust between scientists and public. So um, I'm really hoping that uh, post pandemic we will um, see um, a bit more uh, well, more dialogue actually directly between scientists um, and the public. And uh, I think scientists are, are recognizing this and um, well, we as scientists recognize this and we recognize that we do need to, um, to, to, to put our views forward actually much more because um, otherwise, if obviously if there is vacuum, then this is being filled by something else, pseudoscience, for example, or other things, conspiracy theories and everything else. So um, taking that step uh, forward is really what uh, what uh, a lot of us are actually recognizing um, we will need to do more so uh, post pandemic. And um, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, the trust level uh, will continue and uh, will, will even rise more so between the public uh, and uh, the scientists. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd absolutely agree with both speakers. I think um, I, I hope going forward that the public perception is improved about what science is. So I think at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was this debate about the, the government following scientific advice, I think there was definitely a perception that scientists could say this is the truth and then the government could kind of choose whether to, to listen or not. And I think actually science doesn't necessarily know the absolute truth. Science kind of interprets the, the data that we have at the moment and that can change and therefore the science can change. And I hope forward that 
uh, people are able and, and this, like, you know, kids in school are able to understand that that is how science works. Um, and I think that hopefully will definitely improve the standing of science in the public sphere. Um, and in terms of a key message going forwards, um, I would have to be wash your hands. Thanks very much for that, Ben. Um, well, I think the one thing maybe that brings all of those responses together, and I think it's perhaps a nice way to end, is if anything comes from this also, it will be the necessity to understand that scientists are humans. They are in this also. And actually, if anything we can come out of this, is also the need to humanise science. And that might lead again to a much better understanding of a better society ahead. So it leaves me just to thank each of you for your wonderful contributions today. And I hope everybody out there can give some kind of virtual clap or virtual applause for the contributions. And to also point out that uh, the next in our series will actually be to deal with the health and well-being effects of the virus. And this will be held on Friday, the 12th of June, same time, same virtual place. OK, so thank you for your time again. And thanks to each of the speakers for such an informative conversation today. Thank you.